wrapping up uh, this series called In the Meantime today. We've been addressing this issue that many of us really have experienced. We feel like God has spoken something to us. We feel like God has promised something to us. Or maybe there's a deep desire inside of our hearts that we've been praying about for a long time. But as of now, it has not yet come to pass. Um, we wish it did. If it were up to us, it would have happened already, be done by now. We'd be in our promised land, living large, thinking, isn't God good? We would love that. We would love it. But instead, here we are in the land of unfulfilled dreams, waiting, waiting on God's timing, doing our best to be faithful um, in the meantime, along the way. So what do we do, as Brian was mentioning, what do we do in the meantime? Right now, in the midst of whatever it is that you're going through, instead of just pining away for tomorrow or some other thing, uh, what do we do in the meantime? I do have to tell you, if you have missed some messages along the way, please go onto our YouTube channel and catch up on those, view the message that are there, because it's really too much to recap. So uh, go on uh, YouTube there and catch up there. Now, um, I introduced sort of a God-inspired, pivotal thing for us to do together in the meantime, this thing that we're calling the stool. I know lots of you are joking about the name of it. This is what it is. It's the stool, okay? Uh, just picture a three-legged stool. All three legs are necessary for it to remain standing. You pull one out, the whole thing tips over. Those, th those three legs represent the three facets of this thing that we're calling the stool. Physical exercise, then devotional readings, and then discussion and prayer. Doing all these th three things together somehow has exponential results. It's not just the sum of its three parts. It's somehow they ignite when they come together. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe just because God is speaking this to us now and wants us to experience this thing together during this season. But it's supernatural. Very simply, the explanation is this. You join up with a partner or two, but, but no more. You do some physical exercise together. Whatever you choose to do, you get to choose whatever that's going to be. Then when you're done, you sit down to read the devotional material together. And then you take some time to discuss what you have read. Now, for those that want, we'll provide the devotional materials and also the discussion questions. So by the end of this time together, you end praying for one another or praying for the needs in the group or however God may lead you. Um, but be sure to do this with an open ear hoping, intending, expecting to hear from God. God will speak to you. He'll lead you. He'll inspire you with something. So expect it and uh, elevate your level of expectation because we don't always get what we want. We usually get about what we expect. So expect a lot from God. All right. I realize that some people at this point, they pause and they think like this. Do we really have to do this partner thing? God. I can do exercise and devotions all by myself much easier. Seems like you're just complicating it by having to involve another person. And we do we really have to do the discussion part? Why? That's what resistance sounds like. If you didn't know that, why? Why? That's what it's that's what it sounds like. Here, I want to clear up a misconception. One of the great misconceptions of Christianity today, uh, especially today. Uh, because and it's, it's kind of a subterranean belief, and I'm going to kind of shed some light on it by asking a question, and here it is. Is connecting to God an individualistic quest, or is it meant to be community-oriented? Like, how important are relationships? Do they really matter to God? Here's why I bring this up. You read through the Gospels sometime, and I was doing that earlier this week, Jesus begins his ministry, and the first thing he does is he goes and finds a few others, some ordinary guys, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And what he did by doing this, what he's saying in doing that, is nobody stands alone. Say that with me. Nobody stands alone. Let's do this together. That's what Jesus was saying. Jesus didn't have to do that. He was perfectly capable of living life by himself. It's not like he needed someone to help him teach well. It's not like he lacked power to do healings. It's just that community was his plan to change the world. He chose to do it that way. And when he left the earth three years later, he didn't leave behind any financial resources for his followers. He didn't leave behind a big infrastructure or a budget or buildings or any of the things that we think are crucial for an organization to have. 
He just left behind his friends that he shared his life with. And 2,000 years later, here we are because of what happened through them. I will tell you how seriously Jesus takes this notion of relationships. Uh, those of you who know the New Testament pretty well, maybe you can answer this question. How often did Jesus approach someone and say, I want you to follow me? Kind of look him in the eye. I want you to follow me. But I know you're busy. I know you don't have time to be a part of a group of people. Plus, some of the other people in the group can be kind of a pain. Peter talks too much. Thomas is kind of negative, And Judas, don't even get me started on Judas. <laughs> they're, the point is, they're not normal like you and me. So I'll tell you what. You can follow me on your own. You can skip the loving others part. Just make sure you read the text and you, uh, you attend the lectures or watch online or post some Christian memes on Facebook. You can do Christianity on the self-study plan. Here's the question. How often did Jesus make the self-study plan available to his followers? He never did. He never did. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus, is, what he did first was to prioritize relationships. And throughout his whole ministry, he didn't just teach about it, he modeled it with his own life. And on the last night of his life, he prayed for the oneness of his followers. John 17 records it. Jesus says, I am praying not only for these disciples, meaning the people in front of me, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray they will all be one just as you and I are one, Father. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And then before he ascended, his final words to his followers were, in essence, extend my community. Go into all the world and share the good news. I will be with you. Nobody stands alone. So the third and final leg of the stool is the discussion and prayer part. Discussion and prayer. Like together, not the self-study plan. Several years ago, I got to see a living legend in the world of ministry anyway, uh, just a wonderful pastor teacher by the name of Chuck Swindoll. A lot of you have heard of Chuck Swindoll. He's almost 90 years old now, phenomenal pastor and teacher. One of the few things he said to this gathering of uh, next generation leaders of Christianity was a while ago, and I was the oldest one in the room. Uh, but he says this to the next generation of Christianity. He said, whatever you do in the future, do more together and do less alone. Do more together, do less alone. Now, did you know that people who are socially disconnected are two to five times more likely to die from all causes than those who have close ties to family and or friends? That's the power of staying connected with others. And Jesus knew that there were certain dynamics in living life in his kingdom that only happen when people are, are living in, in real relationships, kind of walking through life together. And I want to walk through what those dynamics are this morning real quickly because they are irreplaceable in our lives as a healthy, thriving follower of Jesus. So just a few of them. Here's the first one. The first one is Jesus is uniquely present in his community. And really, we all know that he's always present in every moment, in every place. But he's present in a unique way when we gather with more than just ourselves, whenever we include others in our personal and spiritual growth. Uh, Jesus said these words in Matthew 18. He says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, he said, there I am in their midst. When you're together, I am uniquely present. I was thinking about sort of a picture of how this works. Um, Years ago, we were camping on vacation, not because we're good at camping, but because we're terrible at camping. Uh, we're still trying to win at camping. Right now, it's camping five, Kelly's zero, okay? Uh, we have never pulled this off successfully. We always forget some, some absolutely essential detail we completely, completely forget. One year, it was the tarp overhead, so if it rains, and it always rains when you're camping, um, it would protect you. Instead, uh, both of us woke up in the tent with our faces in a puddle on the, on the, the tent floor, okay? Um, another year, we were all set. We cooked our first meal over the fire. It smelled unbelievable. We get ready to go eat, and we realized we forgot chairs. There's nothing to sit on. 
So we're just kind of standing there, pulling up a rock. We're, we're fighting over the cooler. We always forget something absolutely <laughs> that's necessary. Well, in one of these attempts at camping, I was getting ready to, to cook over some primitive grill type deal, and I made a, a pile of charcoal. And I poured a couple gallons of lighter fluid over it and, uh, and started the fire. And Dane was really little at the time, and he was watching me do all this. He was just kind of fascinated by the fire. And for little boys, that's a phase that they go through. It usually passes in about 50 years. <laughs> and uh, he asked what I was doing, and I was explaining to him that, you know, you have to make a pile with these little charcoal because the way that they work is when you put them all together, the fire glows and it gets really, really hot. But when you take one out and you put it off to the side, it cools down really, really quickly, loses its heat, and it can't do what it's actually supposed to do. But when they stick together, the, there's this fire and they feed off of each other. And, and I, as believers, we're really just like that. We need others to help us contain the heat. A solitary believer, just like a solitary coal, never lasts all that long. A very wise writer by the name of Dallas Willard wrote this. He said, personalities united can contain more of God and sustain the force of his presence than scattered individuals. Just think about that for a second. Saying people united, people together, contain more of God and sustain the force of his presence much better than scattered individuals off wherever. This is why the writer of the book of Hebrews writes what he did in chapter 10. He says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together. There's that word again, together, as some people do, but encourage one another. The unfortunate truth is, quite often when people start slipping away from God, the first thing that happened is that they've isolated themselves from other believers that were around them. I've seen it happen too many times to, to think otherwise. Too many times. All right, so the first thing is Jesus is uniquely present in his community. The second thing is, Community prevents spiritual drift in our lives. Prevents spiritual drift. In Proverbs 27, 3,000 years ago this is written, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I still hear people say that today. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Most of us have been in a small group, or maybe many groups over the course of your life. I remember one group that I led, there was a guy that was kind of a newer believer, and he was getting used to new life, learning to live new life in Jesus. And as we all know, there's kind of a learning curve on the front end of it as you're learning to walk out this life uh, with Jesus. Community and accountability go a really, really long way in helping us grow and establish new habits for living. It's a good thing. I mean, if you're serious about growing and life change, it's a, it's a very good thing. Well, this guy got used to the rhythm of meeting and talking about our lives and praying for one another. And one day, he just very honestly shared in the group, he said, I realized I either have to take really, really certain action in my life, or I got to find new friends <laughs> because everybody's always checking up on them because they love them. And we're checking up on one another and, and helping us move in the direction that we've chosen. The reality is, no matter how strong or intelligent any one of us thinks that he or she is, none of us is above this need for togetherness. We're all prone to spiritual drift. The right circumstances come about, we are prone to spiritual drift. In community, I am spurred on to do good, and I'm held accountable in that quest. Community tethers me to what I value most. It's what I've chosen. It helps me live a life of authenticity. So what I say I believe, I actually live. It's the second thing. Here's the third thing. Community is the place where it's safe to take off our masks. It's safe to take off our masks. I can only be loved to the extent that I am known. And I can only be fully loved if I'm fully known. In the book of Acts, there's a great phrase there in Acts chapter 2. It says, the people would gather together with sincere hearts. And that word sincere there contains the idea that when they met together, the masks came off and they were real with each other. I recognize it takes a while to build a relationship or relationships like that where there can be that level of openness and honesty. You don't microwave that. It takes time. Now, we can know the, the healing power of knowing others and being known, and we can stop hiding Way, way back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, it said initially that the man and the woman were naked and they were not ashamed. 
That's not just a fashion statement. The, the idea behind that is there were no secrets. Everything about them was revealed and they were loved as they were. And then after they sinned, with the fall came shame. And right behind that comes hiding. Adam says to, uh, to God in Genesis chapter 3, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid, so I hid. Human beings have been hiding ever since. And sometimes people in the church can hide best of all. There was one noted counselor that said this. He said, the body of Christ, especially in a Bible-believing church, is the most healing body in the world, yet we don't treat it as such. We wouldn't think of relating to a medical doctor with the same reserve as we have in the healing body of Christ. Would you go to a doctor's appointment, he said, and say, good morning, doctor, I have this unspoken illness. <laughs> of course not. But we often use this term of an unspoken request in sharing our needs with one another. He said, we choose to hide. We choose to hide. If I'm good at projecting a certain kind of image, something deep inside me thinks, you say that you love me, but you really, if you really knew the truth about me, you probably wouldn't. So by projecting, instead of allowing myself to be known, I actually cut myself off from the love that I so want. It's tragic. Now, Bonnie and I experienced something really pretty cool as we were developing this process that we call the stool. Now, this is just organically grown and had some stutter starts and stumbling along the way. We weren't trying to develop a program. We were just trying to get some discipline in both physical exercise and devotional time that was meaningful to us. So we landed on this stool approach feeling like God really prompted us and nudged us there. And as I said last week, at first we choose these three facets of the stool the exercise, the devotions, and the discussion. At first, we choose them and carry them out. After a while, it becomes a part of who we are, and it carries us. It carries us. There's this great verse in Ephesians 4 that should really be a beacon of light for every single one of us. It says this, We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Now, that can be a lifelong challenge, I realize that. Because ordinary humans like you and me will tend to favor one side of that verse or another, either speaking truth or speaking love. One of them comes easier to you depending on your wiring, like how, what you're naturally like. Bonnie uh, has the natural wiring and gifting of a prophet, so she's all about truth. Truth reigns. Got to speak the truth. Now, Bonnie loves the truth and wants to get to it no matter what, no matter how much it takes to get there, she wants to get to the truth. Now, especially since we've been at this stool thing and relating closer and closer and closer together, she's become really, really skilled at speaking the truth in love. She was always good at speaking the truth. Now she's good at speaking the truth in love. Like when we process devotional readings and we kind of look for ways that God might be speaking to us through all this, she can say what might be kind of a difficult thing for me, but she can say it with love in a way that I can receive, and it makes it so much easier for me to receive it. Which brings me to me. Uh, I don't love confrontation. You know, I've kind of generally, grad gradually kind of make my way away from it. So at times I have avoided a difficult truth if it means a confrontation is coming. So I would sometimes speak truth at the, I mean, speak love at the expense of the whole truth. So God has worked on me with a couple of things in particular. The first thing is, to not really totally freak out when a, when a truth disrupts my soul. Uh, I used to shut down if I felt threatened in some way, and I was way too sensitive about all that. Now, with God's help and the continued challenge that comes with the discussion part of the stool, I've gotten much more okay in allowing myself to be challenged and corrected by God's word without freaking out, and that's kind of nice. Second thing uh, he was working on me with God's helped me to be okay with speaking something difficult, speaking a difficult truth in love. Now I can just take a breath and whisper a prayer and speak what I believe needs to be spoken in the moment. And now I can sleep the night before I have to have a difficult conversation because I used to lay awake at night worrying about it. I was a basket case when it came to that sort of thing. I will say, the stool is absolutely fantastic for married couples, it just is. The unity that comes from doing this is probably unlike anything that you've experienced. Uh, the intentionality, the regularity, the inherent power of God's word, it just kind of draws you together with a unity that's probably unlike anything you've experienced thus far. It's a beautiful thing. 
There's a great author by the name of Gary Thomas who wrote this book called Sacred Marriage. Here's a little phrase out of that. He said, if you, if you want to be free to serve Jesus, there's no question, stay single. Marriage takes a lot of time. But if you want to become more like Jesus, I can't imagine anything better to do than to get married. Being married forces you to face some character issues you'd never have to face otherwise. <laughs> All the married people are chuckling. <laughs> See, by yourself, you can sometimes get off easily or remain unchallenged of that challenge of living up close and personal with someone. But those character issues have to be faced if we're going to grow like God wants us to grow. That's why a huge part of the stool is this discussion and prayer part of it, because God helps us grow in all that. You know, we do the exercise, the devotions, and then you discuss with someone else. It's really, really hard to skim. With someone else, it's really hard to avoid what you have to face. It's more difficult with somebody else, and it's a good thing. My only caution to those married couples that are doing the stool is to, listen, friends, Share the responsibility equally. Don't let one person become the sheriff of Stuhl County. In other words, it's for both of you. Don't make one of you the bad guy, the other one is the downtrodden, oppressed victim, you know? That misses the point, and frankly, it will miss all the power if you do it that way. Share the responsibility equally. You'll have days where you're strong and your spouse is down and then vice versa. There are plenty of times I'm like, oh, do we have to? And I said, no, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then the next night might be the absolute opposite. So share the responsibility equally. Now, all of us, whether it's with a spouse or with a friend or with a family member, can benefit greatly from this experiment. You will see the power in it if you commit yourself to it in faith. We get in better physical shape together. We learn together. We grow in healthy relationships together. And all of us here at Life Church gets to get to experience the power of a godly idea when we step out in obedience and faith. God wants to do something significant in each of our lives. There's no one here special that's got a head start on anybody else. He wants to do something in all of our lives. So get your partner or your partners and begin this week, this week. Some of you will begin today. Five times each week, get together for whatever exercise you'll be doing. And if this is a challenge for you to begin, just start walking together. Just start with walking. As long as you're ambulatory, you can begin to participate in this. And then you sit down together and read the devotional materials aloud together. And if you don't have something that you've settled in on reading, then just click the link of the email that I sent to everybody last night, and you can just choose a devotional plan from, from one of those selections there. All kinds of really good stuff to choose from. And remember, as you do this, be listening in for what God might be speaking to you because he wants to whisper to you, speak to you through it. And if so, when God speaks, note it somehow. Jot something down or put a note in your phone or something so you don't let it slip away. Treasure God's word, especially when God whispers to you. Now, when you're done reading, you just discuss what you read. Maybe bring up that thing that you think God might be whispering to you at that time. Some of the devotional plans that you'll be reading have some follow-up questions built right in, and usually they're really, really good. And then you end with just praying for one another or praying for a need that's represented in the group or all the needs that are represented in the group or however seem, that God seems to lead you there. But relax and enjoy it. There's no pressure, no pressure to produce anything. What we're doing is just positioning ourselves to grow and hear from God, because God wants to speak to you. Increase your expectancy to hear from God. And then maybe just end with, okay, see you here tomorrow at 6.30 p.m., or I'll see you at your place tomorrow morning at sunrise for our walk, or whatever it is that you're doing the very next time that you're going to be together. The point is, all of us doing this together and experiencing this together, we're being proactive with God and with one another, in the meantime. That's the point. And God will bless it.